Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the extraordinary privilege of being the president of the phenomenal Hunter College, the home of the Rosewood House Public Policy Institute, and the place where the American dream still comes true. I am very happy to invite and to welcome all of you tonight to the celebration of Judith Friedlander's new book on the history of that other school in New York, the new school. <laughs> it is a joy for me to welcome Judith back to Hunter, where she was for many years one of the most revered members of our community, a professor, a dean, and a scholar of subjects as diverse as indigenous Mexico, Jewish intellectuals in Paris, and women in higher education. My deep admiration for Judith goes back nearly 20 years to the time when I, I was, shall we say, a somewhat out-of-the-box candidate to become Hunter's president. Her acceptance, her advice, and her counsel then was invaluable, as her friendship in the years after that has become one I deeply treasure. And Judith, I think tonight we should all set a small tribute and celebration to our beloved Erwin, to whom this book is dedicated, your husband, and it's interesting to think of him as the son of, Jew of German intellectuals as part of this story. And he was, of course, so much a part of the history and the prosperity of Hunter College. So in welcoming you and celebrating this book, we celebrate the legacy of Erwin Feisner. I'm equally delighted to welcome back Jonathan Fanton. Jonathan was the first director of Roosevelt House after we reopened it as a public policy institute and its success, its emergence as one of the nation's foremost institutions for scholarship, teaching, and policy debate is our, a tribute to Jonathan's wise and visionary leadership. We even named the John, job after him, so that, Harold, <laughs> so that Harold Holzer, who now carries the mantle of leadership so superbly, is officially known as the Jonathan F. Fanton Director of Roosevelt House. That's how deep our gratitude goes. There could be no better place to welcome Judith and Jonathan for a discussion of her brilliant new book than here in Roosevelt House. This was Franklin and Eleanor's New York home for 25 years until they moved to the White House. This is where Eleanor began her magnificent career fighting for the rights of women, children, working people, and minorities. This is where FDR recuperated from polio and the House served as his campaign headquarters when he ran for governor of New York and then for president. It was in these rooms that many of the programs that became the New Deal were first discussed, most notably in the upstairs library where FDR asked Frances Perkins to become the first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet. She agreed only after he promised to support her plan for an old age insurance program that we now know as Social Security. This is then the perfect venue for discussion of Judith's superbly researched and wonderfully written book since so much of the new school's history coincided with the public careers of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. More than that, many of the issues that galvanized the founders and faculty of the new school were issues in which the Roosevelts were also engaged. It is fascinating, but not surprising, to learn that when she was New York State's first lady, Eleanor was an active member of the fundraising committee for the new school's first building and to read that during World War II, members of the school's faculty were consultants for FDR and the economic and political reconstruction of Europe. And to learn as well that many of the European Jewish scholars who found refuge in the new school's university in exile would go on to serve in FDR's administration. The new school and the Roosevelts were directly engaged in the great challenges of those years, but more than that, they were inspired by the same humanist spirit that Eleanor Roosevelt expressed so well when she said, quote, we will be the sufferers if we let great wrongs occur without exerting ourselves to correct them. Judith's book, which marks this year's 100th anniversary of the new school, also covers, of course, the 17 years when Jonathan was its president. Again, it's marvelous, but not at all surprising, to read that he both strengthened the school structurally and carried on its great tradition of defending human rights, academic freedom, and democratic higher education. Judith was an active part of that history since she took a break from Hunter to serve as dean in the graduate school, where she deepened the new school's commitment to policy research and human rights. And more good fortune, Judith and Jonathan were together again when she returned to our faculty and truth be told, it was Judith who recommended that Jonathan join us at Roosevelt House founding director. So this is a marvelous, you might even say historic reunion 
of two great colleagues, authors, and educational stars. We at Hunter are delighted to be their hosts here at Roosevelt House, and it is a great pleasure to ask me to join you in welcoming Jonathan Fount Fountain and Judith Friedlander. Be Judith Friedlander and Jonathan Fanton. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. It's really wonderful to be back here in Roosevelt House, and I truly appreciate the opportunity you are giving me this evening to celebrate the publication of A Light and Dark Times at Roosevelt House in conversation with Jonathan Fanton. Several years ago, Jonathan, when I interviewed you for this book, you told me that you were grateful for having had the opportunity early on in your career to work for two outstanding university presidents, Kingman Brewster at Yale and Hannah Holborn Gray at Chicago. I too am very grateful for having had the privilege to work with two outstanding presidents, with you at the New School and with you, Jennifer, here at Hunter. I am also very pleased to have this opportunity to thank you both publicly. So what was it like to work with Jonathan and Jennifer for, <clears throat> um, uh, for in the 1990s with Jonathan first and then next with Jennifer in the early 20, uh, 2000s and then with Jonathan and Jennifer together in the second decade of the 21st century? Well, there was never a dull moment. Joking aside, there were, these were truly some of the most exciting and inspirational years of my professional life. While working with Jonathan and Jennifer, I witnessed up close what, uh, the fierce commitment, courage, and skill it takes for university presidents to propose, then succeed in implementing bold new ideas. More often than not, they faced resistance from faculty and students not to mention budgetary constraints and programmatic restrictions imposed on them by external evaluation committees. Commenting on what she saw as the predictable resistance of academics to new ideas, Hannah Arendt once wrote, all academic thinking, whether it is right, left, or middle, is conservative in the extreme. Nobody wants to hear what he hasn't heard before. A light and dark times describes what a difference it makes for an academic institution to have strong leadership. The book examines the ups and downs in the history of the New School for Social Research during what historian Eric Hobsbawm has called the short 20th century. It begins in 1919 with the founding of the New School by a group of intellectuals who wanted to transform institutions of higher learning in the United States, and it ends in 1999 when Jonathan Fanton stepped down as president after having renewed the legacy of this legendary university which had fallen on hard times. The founders of the New School were well-known scholars, journalists, and philanthropists, members of New York's circle of progressive intellectuals. Outspoken champions of academic freedom, the professors among them played leading roles in establishing the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, founded in 1915 to protect the rights of faculty across the nation to express themselves freely. Now, four years later, these professors joined forces with the editors and financial backers of the New Republic to create the New School for Social Research. The early history of the New School speaks directly to debates going on in the present time about the meaning of academic freedom and in doing so, challenges common assumptions about what that movement originally stood for. When we hear faculty and students stand up for academic freedom today, they are usually campaigning in the name of people whose opinions they share. Nobody seems to worry very much about defending the rights of individuals who express ideas with which they disagree. Yet protecting the other side was precisely what prominent scholars had in mind when they came together in 1915 to form the AAUP. Some of them even went so far as to resign from prestigious universities in the name of that principle and set out on their own to build a new kind of academic institution, 
where faculty and students would have the chance to explore new ideas and express their views freely, no matter how controversial those ideas were. The new school opened on February 10, 1919, as an act of protest against academic institutions that had denied faculty and students the right to voice pacifist views during World War I, while Americans were fighting overseas. The main target was Nicholas Murray Butler, president of Columbia University, who had fired two pacifist professors in October 1917 for disregarding the warning made the previous June that what was tolerated before was intolerable now. What had been folly was now treason. The founders of the New School were not pacifists. They enthusiastically supported the war against German allies, Germany, I'm sorry, and its allies, a fact they repeated every time they made their case for academic freedom. Among them were the historians Charles A. Beard and James Harvey Robinson, both of whom had resigned in protest from Columbia University after Butler fired their pacifist colleagues, even though they fiercely disagreed with their colleagues' political campaign. Beard and Robinson's resignation in 1917 caused such a media sensation that people were still talking about what they had done in the winter of 1919 when the new school opened. As the university's first president, Alvin Johnson, described it, every liberal in the city was excited by the novel venture of an institution headed by such dynamic figures as James Harvey Robinson and Charles Beard. Beard's letter of resignation remains one of the most eloquent defenses of academic freedom ever written. As he laid out his reasons for leaving Columbia, the historian made the case for creating a new kind of educational institution where faculty and students would engage in full-throated debates about the major issues of the day. Freedom of expression was critical to the history and health of democracy, Beard proclaimed, and that included educational institutions. The founders of the New School for Social Research envisioned creating an independent school of social science for adults. They saw and believed that if businessmen and other professionals went back to school to study so the social sciences, they would acquire the skills necessary to help America rebuild its political and economic institutions, which had taken a severe beating during the Great War. Despite their lofty aspirations, unfortunately, the founders failed miserably, and several of them abandoned the new school three years later. But their dream of creating a new kind of educational institution endured, thanks to Alvin Johnson, who took over the leadership of the new school in 1922. By the mid-1920s, the new school had become a pioneer in adult education in what Johnson liked to call the continuing education of the educated, providing mature students with the opportunity to attend lectures in politics and, uh, and the arts, and on recent developments in new fields of inquiry, such as anthropology and psychoanalysis, all delivered by leading figures in their fields. Then in 1933, after Hitler rose to power, Johnson created within the new school a university in exile, expanding the institution's faculty with distinguished European social scientists and philosophers who were fleeing Nazi persecution, first in Germany and then in other parts of occupied uh, Europe. And with the university in exile, Johnson finally succeeded in creating a school of social research as the founders had originally set out to do. The speed with which Johnson responded to the sudden expulsion of German academics was astounding. To refresh your memory, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany's Democratic Republic on January 30, 1933. Seven weeks later, on March 23rd, Parliament voted to grant the Chancellor dictatorial powers. On April 1, Hitler introduced the first round of Jewish laws. On April 7, he introduced the Civil Service Restoration Act, dismissing all Jewish and politically unreliable scholars from their teaching and research positions. It did not take Johnson even one week to persuade the new school, its board of trustees, to authorize the creation of the university in exile. On April 14, he announced to a friend that preparations were underway. By early May, he had raised the money to begin the recruitment process, 
and by the end of the summer, he had welcomed his first group of refugee scholars to New York, nine men and, no and one woman, all of them social scientists. Classes began on October 2nd. And please keep in mind that Johnson moved with lightning speed at a time when the U.S. had essentially closed its doors to immigrants, when the country was in the throes of the Great Depression, and when most other academic institutions had, uh, were discriminating against Jews. Johnson opened the university in exile before the vast majority of his colleagues and, uh, at other American universities had even begun to pay attention to the plight of academics in Germany. And he continued rescuing scholars at a frantic pace for the next 12 years. Between 1933 and 1945, the New School provided life-saving visas and jobs for nearly 200 scholars and artists, in large part thanks to the generous support of the Rockefeller Foundation. Thank you, David Rockefeller, for joining us here this evening. Since many of you in the, in the audience have personal ties to Hunter College, you might be interested to learn that Hunter's president, George Schuster, played an important role in the history of the New School during the 1930s and 1940s. The first time in 1938, when he collaborated with, the, with scholars at the university in exile in preparing a new and complete translation of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Shaken by the Anschluss in March 1938, the New School's refugee scholars felt that they had to do more than they were already doing to warn Americans about the dangers facing Europe. Now that the Nazis had annexed Austria to the German Reich, they wanted to reach people beyond the academic community with their urgent message. And the best way to do this, they decided, was with Hitler's own words. Since the only English translation of Mein Kampf was an abridged and sanitized edition, approved by the international, uh, for, um, I'm sorry, um, approved for international com consumption by the Nazi party, they would produce a complete and unabridged edition themselves. The New School's translation would not only restore the missing passages, but would include a set of annotated notes to give American readers the context they needed to understand Hitler's heinous screed. Johnson asked his good friend George Schuster to provide those much needed notes. Schuster at the time was editor of the progressive Catholic magazine Commonweal and the author of two books uh, on, in, not, on Nazi Germany. He had also just returned from Europe on a sensitive mission for the US Department of State, which had sent him to Austria, uh, making him by chance an eyewitness of Germany's Anschluss. A gifted journalist and scholar, Schuster was perfect for the job. George Schuster became president of Hunter College in 1940. After having played a critical role in preparing the New School's edition of Mein Kampf, he stepped forward again in 1942. On February 14, Schuster invited Johnson to use the college's new auditorium on Park Avenue between 68th and 69th Street for the inaugural ceremony that marked the opening of the New School's second university in exile for refugees fleeing Belgium and France. The New School's auditorium could only hold 500 people, while Hunter's could seat 2,000. Endorsed by Charles de Gaulle and his free French movement, the École Libre des Hautes Études offered um, students the opportunity to study in fully accredited French language university. And they received a diploma that would be recognized by France's liberated uh, territories in North Africa, and eventually by all of France and the, and, uh, once the Germans were defeated. Over 2,000 people attended that inaugural event. Then, thanks to Schuster, additional classroom space was provided by Hunter College for courses taught by the faculty at the École Libre. Among the many distinguished scholars affiliated with the French language university was the mathematician André Weil, whose daughter Sylvie became a professor of French at Hunter, from which she retired in the early 2000s. And it's wonderful to have Sylvie with us here in the audience as well. Ties between Hunter and the New School were renewed in recent years 
As we just heard, the current president of Hunter College and a former president of the New School came together in the second decade of the 21st century to develop programs in public policy and human rights in the newly renovated Roosevelt House, strengthening heroic ties between the two institutions. But that's getting a little bit ahead of our story. The first half of, the light, of a light and dark times ends with Alvin Johnson's retirement in 1945. I then turned to the post-Johnson years, taking the story up to the beginning of the 21st century. In these later chapters, I focus primarily on the precarious fate of the old university in exile, an institution that lacked the resources it needed to support a graduate faculty. The history of the new school between 1945 and 1999 is a swashbuckling tale. Throughout those years, colleagues fought bitterly among themselves over shrinking resources and the soul of the institution, leading the university's trustees to consider the possibility on three separate occasions of closing down the old university in exile, also known by 1934 as the Graduate Faculty of Political and Social Science, or the GF. Colleagues had to defend the university as well against damaging accusations by members of outside political groups on the right and the left, particularly during the McCarthy period. And again, they had to uh, defend themselves against outside evaluation committees um, that tr uh, tried to, that questioned really whether the graduate faculty should remain. Accreditation committees rarely sympathized with the unconventional nature of the graduate faculty's interdisciplinary approach to the social sciences, which was firmly uh, rooted in political and social theory. Not that any of this was new. What had changed, however, was uh, after 1945 was the leadership of the institution. Alvin Johnson was a hard act to follow, and he didn't let his successors forget it. Much to their horror, the new school's legendary first president continued to meddle in university affairs well into the 1960s, forcing two of the next three presidents out. <laughs> Johnson died in 1971 at the age of 96. In his final years, he had the satisfaction of seeing the new school flourish again, including the graduate faculty, which by the late 1960s was bursting at the seams with students many of whom were political activists eager to study Marxist economics and critical theory. Other, less radical students came to the new school in droves to earn degrees in clinical psychology. But by the end of the 1970s, things at the graduate faculty were looking bleak once again. The Department of Higher Education of the State of New York had placed the Departments of Philosophy, Sociology, and Political Science on probation, rescinding their rights to uh, to admit new PhD students. In a last-ditch effort to save the GF, the new school's trustees appointed a new president, Jonathan Fanton, in 1982, who in turn appointed a new dean to the graduate faculty, the political scientist Ira Katznelson, who is also here with us this evening. Over the next seven years, Jonathan and Ira led an ambitious campaign to rebuild the graduate faculty during which time they embraced the inspired suggestion of two colleagues in sociology, Andrew Arado and Jeffrey Goldfarb, to renew the legacy of the university in exile by championing the cause of dissident intellectuals in East and uh, Central Europe during the communist period. When Jonathan and what Jonathan and Ira accomplished in collaboration with a group of outstanding colleagues, some of whom were exiles from the region, has extended the legacy of the graduate faculty to the present day. Now, to conclude, I would be happy to continue discussing the history of the new school before 1982 and look forward to Jonathan's questions. But I am first and foremost an anthropologist, and I look forward to listening to the reflections of one of my most important native informants about his time at the new school not to mention those of several other uh, New School natives seated in the audience. I am particularly interested in hearing you speak, Jonathan, about the way you renewed the legacy of the uni old university in exile by restoring its place in the wider academic community as a distinguished school of social research and a champion of academic freedom and human rights. 
You did this, of course, in close collaboration with Ira and other colleagues, but none of it would have happened without you at the helm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Judith, uh, for those kind comments, but uh, for a really inspiring uh, summary of uh, a really great book. Uh, it is a wonderful read, and I uh, urge you all to, uh, to read A Light in, in Dark Times. Uh, Judith modestly um, does not place herself uh, in this narrative, although she was for seven years an outstanding dean of the graduate faculty, uh, making very strong uh, faculty appointments, uh, supporting our efforts to uh, strengthen and study democracy around the world, deepening the New School's commitment to social research, which drew on history and uh, philosophy, indeed, um, uh, disciplines in the humanities and arts uh, far beyond. So let me start with a personal question, uh, Judith. Um, what attracted you to the uh, New School and the graduate faculty? What were some of the challenges that uh, you faced? And as you kind of uh, think about your legacy, what are some of the proudest moments? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Jonathan. Um, as I say in my book, uh, Hannah, I'm quoting Hannah Arendt again. She was, of course, one of the great philosophers who taught at the New School. Um, there are always incidents and stories behind the most abstract theories and decisions one makes. I will spare you most of those incidents and stories because uh, uh, they will take me for the rest of the evening to go through them. But of course, my professional reason for wanting to come to the New School was its legacy its history, uh, which I identified with greatly, having just written a book at that time on, the, on Jewish intellectuals in France, which of course goes over much of the same period of the New School. So I think that was a great draw. But another draw was the fact that I, I was very interested in what you were doing um, at the time, not just the history, but what you were doing at the time. And I thought that I could modestly contribute to the uh, to the work you were doing in human rights and and um, and uh, and the, with the dissident intellectuals in East and Central Europe by opening up that story to Latin America as well. You were already building a program in Latin America when I by the time I got there, but I was able, I think, to strengthen that, and uh, that was one of the things I was most proud of doing. Also, I think I was very excited by the program on. The Center for um, an Eastern Center, East and Central Europe, the Center for East and Central Europe, uh, which Elzbieta Martina, who is here with us this evening, was running. And during my deanship, that was expanded to become the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies, including South Africa, including Latin America. And um, I, that too was something that was really quite exciting. The challenges were many, uh, budget constraints. <laughs> Uh, trying to get along with both the high, the role of a dean, you're both the uh, trying to represent the faculty, and you're trying to represent the administration. That's a very hard trick to play. And at times there were moments uh, when you and I had to uh, fight at demonstrations and what have you. And I remember them with a, a, a with quite a lot of amusement from this distance. But it was tough at the time. <laughs> <laughs> These were not demonstrations against each other. These were demonstrations <laughs> against us. us for, we were for, together on that for, one. <laughs> for, for, for a, a tenure decision. <laughs> but, uh, you know, being uh, back here at Roosevelt House uh, with you and with Jennifer uh, really feels like coming home. And uh, I, I think your continued devotion to the new school is uh, an example of how we become attached to uh, institutions and really care about them uh, over a lifetime. Right. So, uh, and thank you, Jennifer, for your kind comments and for making all this uh, possible. Um, Judith, you, you talked um, about um, the original purposes of the new school, um, teaching economics, sociology, and history. Uh, but then um, you said in the 20s, soon after Johnson took over, uh, the uh, program broadened to include uh, 
um, psychology, uh, the arts, uh, and more. Uh, what's the story? What what happened? Well, it's a it's a long and complicated story. They the the the, the original the original founders had more than one vision. They wanted to both have a research institute, if you will, that was really going to train labor organizers, and they wanted to have a lecture series for uh, educated adults. They didn't have the money to do both. The, f the three of the leaders of the programs, um, uh, Charles Beard, James Harvey Robinson, Herbert Crowley, who was the editor-in-chief of the New Republic, began fighting with one another, and they basically abandoned the project. But they, why were they unable to, to make it work? Their students did not seem to be interested in taking the courses. If you looked at the list of courses they were giving, they were serious courses in economics, in political science, and uh, really to train a generation of students to become, who were adults already, to become, uh, to, to fix the democracy that had suffered so much during World War I. And um, people wanted other things. This was high modernism at this time. The arts were flourishing in New York. And Johnson, understanding this, opened up the program and justified it by saying that the arts were also part of the transformation of society. So that's why he did it. Um, and it was a bigger success. In uh, your book, you uh, describe the role that women played um, at the new school from the, uh, from the very beginning. Um, both as members of the faculty and trustees, and I think of Dorothy Payne uh, Whitney Strait, who uh, bankrolled the New Republic, but also the New School, uh, Ruth Standish Baldwin, who was one of the founders of the National Urban League, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, but also um, Agnes de Lima, who um, was a journalist and school reformer who went on to work at the New School. Um, talk to us a little bit about how the central role of women over the years shaped a distinctive culture uh, right. at the New right. School. Well, we should remember that the New School was founded in 1919, uh, a year before the 19th Amendment had passed. And the, the group who had the proposal for the New School, there were more women on that committee than men. And uh, they were already f assuming that women were going to play a larger role in society. They were anticipating the passage of the, of the, of the suffrage um, movement, um, right to, to vote. And so, and these were women, the women, they were wealthy, and they were in fact the ones who were going to bankroll the new school, uh, more so than the men. The money came from these wealthy women who were not just wealthy, but they were progressive, actively engaged in progressive movements, in the settle house, settlement house movement for one, and they were radical feminists in some cases. One of the people who you didn't mention was Elsie Clues Parsons, the anthropologist Elsie Clues Parsons, who was an advocate of free love. And uh, she was writing wonderful books like The Old Fashioned Woman and Fear and, Con and Con uh, Convention and was shaking things up quite a bit. And there was somebody else who was interested in free love, not only these wonderful women, but Alvin Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> he would not have passed the Me Too movement test, I'm afraid. <laughs> Alvin Johnson was married to a remarkable woman himself who, uh, who got her PhD in philosophy at, at Columbia with John Dewey and who gave him seven children. But he also was having, he had multiple affairs, including one with this woman by the name of Agnes de Lima, who was a journalist and a school reformer. And he had a baby with her as well. Um, and then she came in and worked for him at the new school in 1940, and he was not the she was not the only lover of his who came in. All right, but the but the more serious point. <laughs> so this he, is a book you really want to read, right? I mean, so there I, is a little sex. It's yes. not all high theory. <laughs> it's not all high theory. But she was a, a remarkable woman. Agnes Salim is a remarkable woman, um, and she and their daughter became a, a well-known novelist, Sig Sigrid de Lima, and the granddaughter is a curator of art. Of, of modern art at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts right now, and is, is herself, really. I mean, it's, it's quite a lineage, in fact. But um, I, I, I mention all this, I, and not just to be cute and give you a little sex of what could otherwise be a boring story, but because Johnson wrote to her while he was founding the new, he, she was in California at this point with their child, was writing to her every week as he was founding the, new, uh, the university in exile. And this story is very different from the story he tells in his Pioneer Progress, his, um, his memoir. 
And so in the book, I give you the running account, the daily account, basically, of what it was like to found a university in exile, while he's also um, doing, uh, you know, while he, what it was like while he was also then reconstructs the story later on, which I don't have time to go into now, but in fact, it's his relationship with the Rockefeller Foundation had something to do with the reconstructed version of the story, which, I, as I said, I, I can't go on too long right now. So but I'll, do read, do read. So I've got uh, two more questions, then I'll take a couple, and then we'll open it up to uh, uh, all of you for, for your questions. Um, when the university in exile opened, um, the faculty were not all Jewish. Some had lost their German uh, jobs in the universities because of their political views. Was there a prevailing ideology at the founding of the university in exile? Johnson said that he hired the faculty entirely on the basis of scholarship, not on race. The fact that most of them were Jews was because Hitler was expelling Jews. He was, um, he was, Totally, uh, he, he was a great, great uh, figure in the anti-discrimination movement. We should keep in mind that uh, Thomas Dewey, Governor Dewey, appointed him to two commissions to uh, work on bills to um, improve the, the problem for uh, segregation problems in, in New York. So he was, he was, he just didn't believe in, in this. And what is more, the Jews who came to the New School, what is so interesting about these people, is that they were themselves Jews because Hitler identified them as Jews. Some of them came from families that had already converted. Others were Jews perhaps by, by origin, but they certainly didn't identify themselves culturally as Jews. Now the non-Jews who came, it was about two-thirds Jewish, one-third not Jewish in the early days. The non-Jews who came were um, in many cases married to Jews. So this was a very integrated German community in the 1930s. And um, this is something to keep in mind. And when we talk about anti-Semitism today and we talk about being Jewish identified today, we really have to think about this movement of, of people who were really rejecting religion, both Jewish and Christianity. The Christians were no more religious than were the Jews. And Johnson was very much part of that view as well. So final question. Uh... Your book tells um, the really inspiring story of uh, Ira Katz Nelson coming to the new school and working with uh, Bob Gates and uh, Judy Walzer and uh, others, uh, recruiting a uh, extraordinary new generation of, of faculty. Uh, and in short order, the New York State restored our uh, authority to grant degrees in all of our departments. So when you look at the graduate faculty that um, Ira rebuilt, uh, and if Johnson were still around, what would he think of it? Uh, how did that graduate faculty uh, square with the original vision that uh, Johnson had for the new school? Well, I think, I think I would have loved to have had Johnson um, meet you, Ira. It would have been, I think, a, a wonderful, a wonderful encounter. Well, I think uh, you grasp, you grasp what he was trying to do. There's simply no question about it. Both in terms of extending the idea of the of the dissident scholar and recognizing seriously the the need to reach out and defend academics uh, internationally, and also by um, by having a deep understanding of what the social sciences were about. Uh, you brought the, both the idea that theory, it, both empirical si uh, social science and theoretical social sciences could work together. And I think we'll discuss this a little bit again when we talk about your period, John, uh, Jonathan. But I think that the combination of really recognizing the importance of the, of the distant scholars, the academic freedom, um, writ large, and bringing to the new school people who, who came out of the next generation. I mean, there was Eric Hobsbawm, there was Agnes Heller, there was Ari Zolberg, there were these people who came out of that European tradition. And then you also, of course, um, understood the social sciences, the theoretical grounding of the social sciences. Johnson very famously said um, that all the social sciences were really based in philosophy, and I think you really understood that as well. 
I should um, note that we have yet another dean of the, a former dean of the graduate faculty here, Kenneth Pruitt, who uh, was a dean of the graduate faculty, but also during the rebuilding period, uh, a critical advisor uh, to uh, Tyra uh, and to me. So Ken, it's nice to, nice to have you here. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions, but, yes. I, but not many, because I think we should right. open Jonathan it up. Jonathan did not want to talk. <laughs> but, so, and I, well, really I don't want to spoil him. the book. They should buy the well, book. Well, I know, I know. But I would love you to talk a little bit about your own experiences. Um, and also, you know, um, I think then let me just start, since time is getting short, with the, um, the fact that before you came to the new school, you had both studied and um, worked at Yale and Chicago, two institutions that had very, very wealthy base, uh, alumni bases. And this gave, you come to the new school, and like uh, Johnson, you do not have the same thing at the new school. This was a continuing education school, for the most part, without that long, long tradition of giving. And in fact, they didn't even have um, an endowment until the 1960s. So you had to build a donor base um, as did Johnson, by developing a group of friends. And, and um, some of the friends that you worked with dated back to the Johnson period. There was Dorothy Hirschhorn, who was, uh, who was the head of the Board of Trustees when you were, when you were appointed, who had joined in the 1930s with, with Johnson. However, you also brought in a, a wonderful new group of, of um, friends to the university, including a group of European exiles themselves who had come to this country during the, um, the uh, Nazi period. Among them, of course, Henry Arnhold, and I'm very happy that Jody Arnhold, uh, Henry's daughter-in-law, is with us. Henry just died a few months ago um, at the age of 96 after having been a very dear friend of the university, both in your period and, and onward. And I just thought you might want to talk a little bit about Henry and about that whole um, I can't call. I don't want to call it a strategy. It sounds too pragmatic. But you know, but your the way you developed your friends and why you you wanted to get this group um, to get interested in the new school. <clears throat> well, I'll start with um, a confession. Um, I, I didn't ask uh, enough questions um, when I was being uh, interviewed. <laughs> And I was at, uh, at the University of Chicago. I was uh, thrilled at the opportunity to lead an institution. And while I was still there, after having been appointed but not having moved to New York yet, I got a call from uh, the, he was then called the business manager, and he said, I just wanted you to know we're activating the line of credit uh, at the uh, chemical bank because uh, we, you know, we need to pay uh, the, the August salaries. I said, what? Well, don't, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. We do it every year. Uh, we don't have the money until the tuition is paid from the adult students um, <laughs> in September. <laughs> Having come from Yale and Chicago, this was a, a real revelation. Uh, uh, but I still came. Um, but I then asked a lot of questions and discovered the place was basically bankrupt. Uh, now, I came with the mandate to rebuild the graduate faculty. I had um, recruited uh, Ira Katz Nelson, uh, who was not shy about uh, getting certain commitments, which I had made. Um, and so I, I faced a real, uh, a real crisis. And fortunately, um, there were some trustees, and Henry was about to be a trustee, uh, Walter Eberstadt and uh, Michael Gellert, <clears throat> and uh, I would say most of all Henry, um, who understood the importance of the graduate faculty, had an emotional tie to it, and uh, said to me, I, and I was honest with them uh, about the challenge, and they said to me, uh, you need to go forward in making um, some first-rate appointments we need to get the accreditation back, and that depends on making three, four, five, six uh, really eye-catching appointments. And that's, of course, what I committed to IRA. And they said they would put up the um, expendable money for the first few years. So here we are making tenured 
appointments without the endowment to um, undergird the tenure, but uh, I had faith that uh, they would work with us and, and be uh, even more generous if Ira could make uh, these great appointments, which he did. Uh, and I think uh, Ari Zolberg was probably the first, and Charles and Louise Tilly were the second. We made those appointments, and Ira himself, that sent a signal that this was serious, and uh, it went from there. But Henry was more than uh, just uh, uh, a generous financial supporter. He was a personal friend. Uh, we both lived in Connecticut, and we played tennis uh, from 1983 until just before he died. Uh, every Sunday I was there. Um, he uh, was an intellectual leader on the board, uh, really understood uh, the special uh, qualities of the graduate faculty and uh, uh, supported uh, Ira's vision of not just rebuilding any old graduate faculty, but one that really had roots uh, in its European past. Uh, he also was on our finance committee, our investment committee, and uh, really thought about the, the strategy of the university, and not just uh, the graduate faculty. He was a, a, a real champion of the, of the arts. <coughs> um, very uh, passionate about Parsons, uh, very supportive when we um, started a jazz program very supportive when we uh, emerged with the Manus College of Music. Uh, so he was there for the whole whole university, and I would say uh, was probably uh, my closest uh, trustee advisor. Okay. A longer um, answer than uh, you no, wanted. No, no, that was uh, exactly what I was hoping you would do. Thank you. Um, I, I also, I, you more or less answered part of my next question, which was to ask you to talk a little bit about the rebuilding with Ira and the wonderful faculty that you did hire um, at that time. but And the list went on and on. I mean, it was really remarkable. But you also embraced this idea of extending, both of you embraced the idea of championing the human rights in, um, in East and Central Europe. Let's remember that this is before uh, this was uh, this is during the solidarity period, and you were recruiting faculty from this part of the world, but were also building um, a network. That um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, perhaps of Adam Michnik, the period when you gave Adam Michnik a an honorary doctorate, the development of a certain seminars, and the then the strengthening of programs in this part of the world after 1989. Well, I think Ira and I um, both understood the, the new school uh, stands for something. It's not just any other university. Uh, it had uh, two points of founding, 1919, but then again uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and there was a situation in the world, in East and Central Europe, former Soviet Union, um, that really um, called out for our best efforts, that uh, values were at stake, but opportunities uh, began to present themselves. And we had two faculty members, Jeffrey Goldfarb and Andrew Arado, who had already begun to work with uh, scholars underground in Poland and uh, in Hungary. And um, through them, uh, we got educated about uh, the really vibrant underground that existed not just in those countries, but throughout the region through the generosity of Dan Rose, who was here, uh, I had some funds to uh, begin to travel in this region for the first time. And through the good offices of uh, Joan Davidson, uh, the daughter of uh, Jack Kaplan, who was a, a chair and a leading figure at the new school, um, I got connected with uh, a new organization called Helsinki Watch, uh, that now, of course, has matured into Human Rights Watch, working around the globe, but there, I became involved in its work in East and Central Europe. And so I then saw the, the people that were human rights activists were also many of the same people that um, Andrew um, and uh, Jeff were working with, um, Adam Mishnik uh, you know, among them. So I got uh, educated, and gradually we began to uh, grow our uh, seminars, uh, uh, underground seminars in those days. We had to smuggle 
documents in pre-internet. Um, they would write something. We would smuggle it out to get it uh, published. We would be followed, or at least worry we might be. Uh, and when it came time for the uh, 50th anniversary, um, we uh, made a number of uh, honorary degrees, including uh, Adam Mishnik of Poland, uh, who was, I uh, believe, either put back in jail or at least prevented from, uh, it was, was imprisoned. In prison. And uh, 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 so as well, Mimos came and took the degree on his behalf. But when uh, Adam was uh, released, uh, we went to uh, Warsaw to uh, confer the degree. I recall if uh, it was on December 10th, International Human Rights Day. And it was interesting. There was an economist named Lipinski who agreed to have his apartment used, and the word got out, and the press came. And uh, it was, of course, uh, short days, and uh, it was dark when we, the, we got going, and the um, authorities cut off the power to Lipinski's apartment. Uh, so there we were to confer the degree, and but no light. Uh, but that um, turned out to be a good thing because the um, international press was there with their uh, battery-driven cameras. And so the whole ceremony, um, not just a little clip, was uh, filmed so we could see. And that gave it much broader coverage. Uh, <laughs> All, all, all over the world. <laughs> so, um, any case, our uh, work uh, matured. Uh, we, uh, through Elsbieta's uh, good efforts, um, had um, nourished democracy seminars in a number of countries, and then had at least once a year uh, a democracy uh, seminar where all the leaders would come. Then Elsbieta started uh, a summer uh, program and. Uh, uh, where was it? Uh, Krakow, uh, uh, initially, um, where uh, scholars, and this is now later as uh, things began to open up, uh, but where uh, democracy, the prospects for democracy uh, were studied. Yeah. And that, I think, continues to this day. And then Ari and Max started a journal donation project to um, make up for all the years that uh, these universities uh, couldn't get the journals. And so we took on the uh, the uh, challenge of helping once uh, 89 happened, helping uh, rebuild academic life and reconnect um, uh, scholars to the uh, uh, social sciences they've been denied. Um, and so it, uh, and we also uh, helped new universities that were getting started, the Central European University uh, that was in Prague and Budapest and uh, European University of St. Petersburg, U uh, European Humanities University, and uh, uh, Minsk, Belarus. So we did quite a lot. Yeah, it was really impressive. I know we can't, we have to end very quickly here. Let me just very quickly ask you if you don't mind mentioning, you didn't only do work internationally, but you were really involving the new school in American academic freedom and freedom of expression issues, including taking on the Helms Amendment, if you please, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And if you would just briefly mention that project as well. I will, I've, and before I do, I'll also mention that uh, the uh, Lyon College, the undergraduate college, um, uh, sponsored a, um, an event, um, and I've forgotten, was it the, uh, the War College, I think, 1985. <clears throat> and um, this got uh, shouted down by the uh, students, actually, of the graduate faculty. And that uh, led me to uh, appoint a committee chair by Ira Katz Nelson to look at the issue of academic freedom, freedom of expression. And uh, he wrote a brilliant report that um, I, I've used uh, in all my uh, subsequent jobs, really saying, you know, this is, this is tough going. And um, my, my central recollection was that uh, it was all right to have a protest. <clears throat> and so long as the protest didn't um, censor uh, the um, event. So there was a judgment call to be made about how long the protest could go on, but at least uh, oppositional views could be heard. And then eventually, uh, having been heard, the, the event as scheduled should go on. There was much more to it than that, but that was the operational takeaway. 
any case, we had been um, stake in the ground since 1919 on academic freedom and freedom of expression. And when the um, uh, we were undertaking the renovation of the courtyard between two of our buildings on 12th and 11th Street, and we applied to the National Endowment for the Arts for a planning grant to put together a sculptor and a landscape architect, so to take this kind of dull space, but really turn it into uh, a living piece of art and useful to uh, to students. And happily, we uh, were awarded in uh, April of uh, 1990, I think it was, um, a fifty thousand dollar planning grant. I was delighted, and so I was reading through the document I had to sign, and whoops, there was the language of the Helms Amendment, basically saying you can't uh, spend any of this money on something that would be pornographic or obscene or whatever. Um, and you remember that Helms Amendment. And so I um, signed the document, but I struck out the um, paragraph on the Helms Amendment, and we sent it back to the NEA. And um, I got a phone call. I was sitting in the kitchen of the president's house. I got a call, phone call from the um, uh, chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, John Frommeyer. And he said, I um, really want you to accept this grant, but um, I want you to uh, sign a new version that has the Helms Amendment in, that you struck out. I said, I, I agree with you, but I have a fierce problem in the Congress and getting reappropriations, and I can't, I just can't let this happen without your signing the document. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't sign it, and um, I'm therefore giving you warning that um, if you deny us the grant, uh, we're going to sue you. So I then went to uh, our friend Floyd Abrams, who agreed pro bono to take the case, and we sued the NEA. And when, um, in the um, run-up, you know, they take depositions, and so a, a deposition was taken of Frundmeier, who was asked by Abrams, um, um, this language is a little vague, could you, uh, Mr. Frundmeier, de define for us uh, what is homoerotic? Uh, and there were a series of these questions, which uh, Frundmeier really stumbled on badly. And the um, Justice Department lawyers read over his testimony, his deposition, and said, we're going to lose this case. And so since putting this paragraph in the contract was not mandated by Congress, but was Frundmeier's decision, the Justice Department said, take it out, give the new school the money. And um, we, we did. We also made available all of our legal uh, work um, to uh, um, some institutions in California who then launched a lawsuit in, in a very friendly, what is it, the Ninth Circuit out there, I think, uh, a, a case that they won. So we, we really brought down the, uh, the Helms Amendment. Sorry for the long story, but it was... But no, it was, it's a great story. I wanted you to hear story. it. So let's take uh, let, let's take maybe five minutes of questions. Can we do that, uh, Dan? Oh uh, yeah, and may I ask uh, two things? One, if you would identify yourself, and since we're out of time, we got a lot of questions. Make it a question, in short. Well, I, I can't make it a question. But I have to make it a very brief comment. As one who knew and admired Alvin Johnson, I feel certain he would have acknowledged Jonathan Fanton as a kindred spirit, both being individuals of intellect, knowledge, and character. The only distinguishing characteristic between the two was their attitudes on marital fidelity. <laughs> but but Thank last you. comment. Thank you. <laughs> There's no question that Alvin Johnson would have been thrilled with what the new school had become under Jonathan Fanton. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Which is why I wrote the book the way I did. <laughs> so other, some other questions. we got time for a couple more. <laughs>
Yes. Oh, oh, same family. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did any of the uh, professors who came to the new school go down and teach in the black colleges? Because many of the... Well, in, well, many, first of all, as I mentioned, about over 200, 200, not over, but about 200 people were, came to the new school first. And then many of these people did not stay at the new school, but went on. And indeed, they did go on to the historically black colleges. Not only, but to, uh, you know, I don't, have, I don't have the specific details at the top of my head, Joanna, but yes, the answer is yes. Did, did Holborn teach at the new school before he went to Yale? Uh, he came through the new school, but never taught here. Uh, he was part of a group that was, were, and, and that was, the University of Exile was much broader than just the people we uh, taught, because we placed them at, at, different, at, at different universities. Yeah. Yes, uh, Faye. Uh, I should say Faye Rosenfeld, um, more than anybody I know, is responsible, other than Jennifer, for this place uh, really getting off to a great start. She's, 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 she's. Judith, for as long as I've known you, you've been working on this book. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions I want to ask you. But um, I'm wondering, what is the most surprising thing that you learned about the new school in the course of your many years of doing research into this book? My god. <laughs> the most surprising? I, You know, Faye, I, I, I think I, I knew the story before I came to the new school. I think what surprised me most was, was just how, how I couldn't get enough of it. I mean, I was just so moved by what had happened and what was continuing to happen at the new school. I can't say that that was quite a surprise, but it was just a conviction and a confirmation of the importance of having an institution that really does stand for something and having the courage to continue doing it. it it's not easy. This was a struggle. Uh, Jonathan, you know, never having money was, of course, one of it, one of the major problems that they had. But they also, they were neither left nor right, and they therefore were constantly being attacked from both sides. And they, they stuck to it. Yes, in the back. I, I'll, just, I have a, I'll give it to you a second. I, okay, so you've talked about your international expansion in terms of human rights and democracy, but you only briefly alluded to sort of the domestic expansion of the new skills. You mentioned the Manus College of Music, and since that time, there have been other schools that became part of the new new school. Can you talk a little bit about how that evolved as a philosophy in terms of the expansion of the new school? Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, go. Well, That's but, really a good question. Well, but it, it starts before me, so why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the new school. The new school was a conglomerate of schools. Ultimately, I mean, it started with the continuing education program, and then it had the, and then it had the. Um, the, the university in exile. Then within continuing education, there were constantly new programs being added. For instance, Johnson had the idea during the war to create, to benefit from the GI Bill, which was just being put together, and to create a BA program, which was a, a credit program, bearing program. And then, and then there, was a, there was the idea to bring on an urban studies and urban affairs program. Um, Manus came on much later, and that's in Jonathan's period that Manus is going to join the new school. The other very big and very important addition in 1970 was Parsons School of Design. It was a big risk, and it saved, financially saved the new school. <coughs> and, you know, and I could add that w there was some question about bringing on a so-called trade school. <laughs> it was why some people saw the, the Parsons School of Design unfairly. But of course, Johnson, from the very beginning, was very much interested in the plastic arts, so that this fit very nicely into what he was doing. When you think of the 20s, Thomas Hart Benton, Martha Graham, Jose Clemente Orozco, uh, Bernice Abbott, uh, there were a lot of uh, people in the arts who were teaching. So the new school had a real uh, uh, deep commitment to the arts. So this was kind of natural to begin to expand uh, in, in degree programs uh, in the Absolutely. arts. Absolutely. Yeah. Bill Hubbard, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, does, the have, does the school have an endowment now, and how large is it? Uh, the school does have an endowment. And what do you uh, I, I, I'm not up on how much it is, but I well, think it's got to be north of a couple hundred million. It's not huge. 
Uh, but Bill, uh, there's room for more. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one last question. Uh, is that you, Ken? The audience might be interested to know that there's yet another chapter in the University of Exiles uh, forward movement. And you may want to describe it very briefly. Uh, are we talking about the new university in exile? Yeah, Arian Mack, who is sitting over here, uh, and who is the brilliant editor of Social Research, and also the uh, founder of the Journal Donation Project, has taken the lead in establishing what we're calling a new university in exile. And this is, and you'll correct me if I misspeak, Arian, but um, organizations like the uh, IIE and Scholars at Risk, Scholar Rescue Fund, uh, are to this day, bringing scholars out of countries all over the world, um, Turkey, Syria, uh, you, you name it. And they come and are placed uh, at different universities one at a time, and they're lonely. Um, and they're a little uncertain about their future. And uh, uh, Arian has had the brilliant idea of getting a consortium of universities to come together um, to form what we're calling a new university in exile. And there is a, uh, was it during the school year, a weekly, is it weekly seminar? Um, that the new school organizes um, um, over uh, video, uh, but then occasionally they get together in person. So, Aaron, would you like to say anything more about it? Did you hear? The president of Hunter has just said, done. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That's wonderful. Well, that's all, that's all I need to say. That's a wonderful end to this evening, is to have Hunter join us as part of the consortium. I, mean, I will write to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you anyway, they have, thank you, Judith. This, right. has, been, this has been terrific. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, the, after this, there's a, there's a reception upstairs, so uh, uh, please join us. And, and oh, uh, Judith uh, notes that she could be persuaded to sign her book or two, uh, if anybody. <laughs> so she'll be upstairs, and it really is a great book. Thank you very much.